thank you. This is really, really amazing. <laughs> and so I'm about to, and um, I'd like to talk about um, legacy code. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, a bit, uh, I'm a bit unusual because uh, as uh, I got introduced, I kind of like working on legacy code. But, uh, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, I can transmit you a bit of uh, this love <laughs> before the end of uh, my talk. So, um, let's, legacy system. Uh, I cannot really see you, but uh, how many of you work on a legacy system? Okay, I think it's a good uh, percentage. And uh, I was uh, uh, preparing this talk and discussing with a friend of mine, and uh, I realized that uh, I used to work uh, in uh, banks and uh, big institutions. And in our case, uh, legacy systems usually are very, very old systems that uh, probably make a lot of money for the company, but they are very complicated and nobody really knows how to work on it. But then some friend of mine working on startups, and for them, a legacy system was just a last year system. <laughs> because uh, there was uh, something that they just uh, put uh, hacking up all together very quickly in order to go on the market. And then uh, there was a pivot, and then there was something else. And that the system uh, immediately became uh, a, a problem, a liability. But I think my talk kind of work for both ways, for both kind of situation. And of course, you have all the possible in, in the between. But uh, OK, let's say when we talk about legacy system, in, uh, I know uh, we are in London, and uh, there is always a recruiter that call us uh, developers. Um, and uh, they call us and tell you, ah, this is a Greenfield project. and. Uh, and they always are greenfield projects, <laughs> even when they are not. <laughs> but uh, because this, this uh, image that a greenfield project is much better than a brownfield project, uh, something that we are working on legacy system. But I don't know. Let's see a bit. And uh, so, what is a legacy system? Um, yeah, a legacy system is something with squirrel inside. <laughs> It's something that is very hard to maintain, to expand, and to improve. That is, I think, is the main point. That, uh, but it's also very important that it's something that is working and is making money. Because if it's something that is not really working, that is not the legacy system. That's something that you throw it away and full stop. Legacy system, uh, I mean something that is really core for the business. It's something that is making money, and uh, that is uh, its value. And how to recognize a legacy system? One uh, typical thing is that uh, it was a very good design. And it was actually maybe too good for its design. So people start saying, OK, maybe we can use for also for this, and this, and this. And you know, after a while, it became really overloaded. But it still works. So I mean, it kind of is amazing. And the other kind of uh, characteristic of a legacy system is the continuous state of emergency. I work, uh, let me just tell you a quick story. I mean, uh, yeah, in a bank, so that, uh, and uh, there was this team, and in a the bank they have this uh, level of uh, emergency, level uh, four main, main, means that something that really is not that important. Then level three, level two, level one be, means something that goes on, on uh, the um, newspaper, so um, financial newspaper, so it's quite something that the uh, customer can actually perceive. And there was this um, project with uh, continuously level two emergency. Level two is something that already is uh, impacting uh, banks, I mean money for the banks. And uh, they were used to have uh, like a, a level two emergency every week. That was really, really, I mean, I couldn't really imagine to work on those teams because they have so much pressure. But for them, after a while, it becomes kind of normal and uh, nobody really cares. 
And then, yeah, another characteristic of a legacy system is that uh, they are quite hard to retire because nobody really knows who is using them. And uh, you can imagine, wow, come on, how it can be difficult to know who is using them. But uh, for example, another real story, there was a system that uh, it was meant to be retired. They check everybody that was using that system. OK, they replace everywhere. And then at the end of the year, came after that there was another application that ran only once a year to prepare the final report. And that application was still using the old system. And the old system was not there anymore. <laughs> and the report <laughs> must be out tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow, next week. And uh, it's really a legal uh, requirement. So <laughs> what do you do? I mean, this is the kind of problem that you have uh, with the legacy system. So. In, in a world, we can say that, uh, how many of you are, um, know the te technical debt uh, term? OK, everybody, yeah, perfect. So I don't have to explain. So when your technical debt reach to some point that is so high, so you have to, basically, you feel that you cannot ever be able to repay, then it's really, really a problem with the legacy system. So, what to do? My talk is finished. <laughs> uh, there are some uh, kind of solution. The first solution, Dutch tape. Okay, you just have to fix it and uh, keep going. This is uh, the probably most common solution. Okay, it's important, let's fix it. Don't worry about, let's just keep it running. Uh, I, this is a real race car. I mean, I hope uh, everybody was uh, safe after the race. <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the reality of a business, uh, there is no uh, uh, finish line. I mean, you have to run and run and run. So really, the Dutch tape, yeah, the solution one is a bit of a short sight. And uh, the other problem with solution one is what is called uh, the low or broken windows which is means, means uh, that uh, if you have an old building that nobody is inside, I mean, it's OK. Then someone uh, broke a window. And maybe the uh, building was there for one year and was OK. But after they broke the windows and they see that uh, nobody complained, nobody replaced the windows, probably in just a few weeks, all the other windows will be broken because there is a perception that uh, nobody, that is abandoned. Nobody really cares. And uh, it's kind of happened the same with the code. So when you start uh, doing uh, this kind of a fix type, I mean, quick fix, then uh, you start uh, accumulating. And then uh, new people that maybe working on this project to see that uh, nobody really cares. So they say, OK, so whatever it, uh, it works, even if it's a really, really bad situation, if, even if it's something that probably we'll regret in the future, let's fix it. Copy, paste, whatever. Just fix it. And this is going worse and worse. And this is also accelerating. So solution two, forget the new system. Let's rewrite. Shiny and new. Yeah, fantastic. OK, we, we need. Uh, we need the money for do that, but probably, I mean, usually in bigger banks, but even in startups, you, you got the, your funding, you got the, your budget. So let's put the money. This is the solution too. And what is the solution to problem? That uh, <laughs> more often than not, the new rewrite not, doesn't cut, uh, it doesn't work, and uh, it got less unfinished. And uh, I've been working on a real system that uh, the actual system was older. I mean, the first commit in the source code was older than the new grad that was joined the team. <laughs> and uh, the, the system was about uh, like 90s, mid 90s. And uh, they already tried to replace three times in the banks. And each time, they weren't able to, 
to finish the rewrite, and then they say, okay, now this is not going to work, let's rewrite again. And every new top manager say, okay, this back system is really a lot of problems, let's rewrite, and, uh, and why is that? This is a bit trickier than uh, the previous point. Then uh, there is a kind of a success bias. So you see the old system, and you see the old system code and say, oh, come on, if those guy who wrote this terrible code were managed to make it work, must be very easy. But it's not, <laughs> because what you are looking is uh, something that is working. So something that is, has already a lot of uh, work on it. I mean, a lot of uh, proven, battle-proven um, experience inside that code. And so you are judging that code as very bad, but it's actually a code that has already survived a lot of battles. When you start from scratch, you don't really know about those old battles. And uh, when you do a lot of assumptions that usually they are not, uh, <laughs> they're really not working. And uh, when you start doing uh, uh, the replacement, you really realize that uh, it's not uh, going to work. And uh, usually when they do this rewrite, uh, the, yeah, I think it's a terrible idea, but the most typical pattern is that they keep the old team fixing uh, doing maintenance, and then uh, they hire a new guy, and they say, okay, you guy, you have adjusted to replace this uh, system. And the new guy have no experience with the, with, the bank, with the company. They have no experience exactly what the old system was doing. They just have a very experience on some new uh, framework, uh, new technology that for any reason, maybe it's a very good technology, maybe it's not, but uh, whatever. Uh, they, they really don't have any connection. And then uh, they do a lot of assumption that at the end that it really doesn't work. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that never works, but in a lot of, lot of cases, probably. The and also, at the end, there is the data migration that uh, nobody really considered. I mean, everybody, when they do the nice Gantt diagram, they put, okay, let's put uh, two weeks of data migration, whatever. But it's very hard to do data migration, and sometimes it really takes uh, it can e even fail the project because they realize that they cannot really migrate the data. So let's take another point of view. <laughs> you probably know who is uh, this guy by install soup. If you are a developer and you don't know him, maybe you should uh, <laughs> uh, study who is that. Uh, and. Uh, this point of view is quite uh, yeah, typical of experience uh, programmer. That the legacy code actually, the only difference is that it actually works. <laughs> the new Greenfield project uh, is still unproven. And uh, for me, the inspiration from uh, this talk and also from uh, uh, my job, it came from uh, a travel in Japan. And um, in Japan, there is uh, this thing called uh, kintsugi, which is uh, a kind of art that, uh, well, I'll tell you the story. So the story, I don't know if it's true, but the story goes like that. There was this, uh, like, the emperor of Japan, which have a very precious Chinese uh, porcelain vase that got broken. And the emperor said, oh, this is really terrible because I was really enjoyed that uh, vase. So what I can do? So he sent the vase back in China to a repair. And uh, he came back with a kind of a very crude repair with, uh, I mean, it was well done, but it was still a repair that was trying to hide the fact that uh, the vase was broken, but it wasn't really working. And so the emperor said, no, this is not really going to work. I want a repair that uh, doesn't hide the fact that uh, the object is broken, but uh, I mean, build on top of it. And uh, this kind of art in Japan, this uh, kintsugi, is actually, yeah, uh, they use uh, some uh, lacquer, some techniques, and then uh, they cover with uh, uh, gold leaf or, I mean, some uh, metal stuff to make it clear that uh, the object has been broken, but it's still uh, beautiful. 
And so, I don't know, it's a bit unrelated to software, but it kind of reflects me that maybe we are looking at uh, the legacy code in uh, slightly, um, what can I say? <laughs> but th there must be another point of view. And uh, you may know that uh, this um, uh, strangler pattern, I mean, or progressive rewrite. And uh, which is, I think, is a kind of a kintsugi of the software code. And um, Martin Fowler, you, who know Martin Fowler? Oh, it's quite. Uh, so if you know, I mean, if you are a technical architect or you wanted to write something, I mean, to study software architecture, you probably look at the Martin Fowler's book because they are very, very, also his blog is very, very good. And um, what basically he said that, uh, yeah, the point of a strangler application over a full rewrite is the reduced risk. So the, just to, uh, I, I, I didn't explain very well. The, the idea of a strangler application is uh, to create a new application, but on top of the uh, previous one. So actually, I should explain better. <laughs> like this tree, so it's something that goes around the old application and uh, slowly, slowly, completely substitute uh, the old application. So it's something that uh, starts uh, together and then uh, it's, uh, it's very different from uh, starting a new rewrite, uh, complete the rewrite and then uh, switch up because it's something that uh, starts together. Uh, for, for example, just to give you a real case example, you have an old um, client server application written in C Sharp. You decide that is move to the Scala, uh, to, well, to, yeah, to, to the Scala plus um, JavaScript. And uh, so basically, you keep the old C Sharp application and you open a new port to that application, so you can start using a JavaScript front-end with the old application as a back-end. And then, slowly, you start moving a feature from the old application to the new one, and then you start putting the new back-end, and then you're still keeping the old application as a kind of skeleton, and then you're removing one piece at a time until the, you can completely remove the old application. And uh, it's real that uh, it takes a, uh, it's a kind of convoluted uh, path to, to go there. And this probably take more time than, uh, I mean, the planned refactoring, but uh, rewriting, I mean. But it's actually taking uh, less time, probably much less time than uh, the actual time spent. Because uh, everybody is very happy with, uh, I mean, when doing the estimates. But uh, you, we know that there are a lot of uh, unknown unknowns that will uh, impact. Instead, uh, with the progressive, uh, the strangler pattern, the progressive uh, refactoring, we are able to, to be very consistent and uh, quite uh, confident that we can finish in time. But this is introducing another uh, topic, code quality. And uh, I think that uh, we, as industry, got it completely wrong, what is code quality. Um, if you ask uh, probably tens, you junior developers, what is uh, code quality, what code quality means, or how to recognize a good uh, uh, quality in the code, you probably heard a lot of uh, stuff like uh, clean code, TDD, functional programming, uh, um, design patterns, and stuff like that. Uh, which is uh, absolutely great, but those are tools, those are techniques. This is not quality. You cannot say this code has a good quality because it's uh, implementing one, two, three, four design pattern. Or this is code is a good quality because it has 95% uh, test coverage. That is a completely crazy way to, to measure quality. I think that uh, the real code quality measure, the only measure that really matters, 
is that time that it takes to implement a feature. And uh, you, if you are still able, after years and years, to implement a new feature in a kind of fixed amount of time, then you have a good quality. And uh, the same is also true for bugs. If you are able, there will be always bugs in our code. We cannot really aim to have a zero bug system. But uh, we can aim it to be a system where fixing the bugs require a fixed amount of time. Then we can always fix bugs in a few days, a few hours. And uh, if we are in that position, then we have a good quality. And it doesn't really matter how we go there. Then, of course, TDD, code, um, clean code, uh, functional programming, whatever, they are very useful to go there. But they are not the goal, it's for sure. Instead, I still keep hearing and hearing people say that, uh, yeah, we have a very good code quality because uh, we have, uh, yeah, 99% uh, test coverage. I never, I mean, it's very hard to hear someone say, we have a very good quality because we are able to fix every bug in less than two hours. Or we have very good quality because uh, after 10 years, we are still able to release a new feature in uh, every week. I don't know, something like that. And I think uh, this is also that something we, we, we have to keep present because it's all about architecture at the end. So let's talk uh, a bit about our architecture. And uh, so this is a nice tea house, Western architecture which is really, really nice. To be honest, I, I don't even know where it is, but it's really, really nice. The problem is that uh, it's kind of a perfect as it is. You cannot really imagine to add something, to remove something, or to change something. And uh, it's also very new and shiny, but uh, you can imagine that uh, if uh, we leave it, it is by itself, it will uh, quickly I mean, getting bad, bad, uh, terrible. And if it's not completely new and shiny, it will be bad. And uh, going back to Japan, this is how Japanese things uh, uh, like a tea house. You can see that the style is very different. But don't think that uh, the Japanese is a cheap tea house, because <laughs> doing a, a tea house like this is still maybe less expensive than the other, but it's still very expensive. It's not a, a cheap solution. But the Japanese idea is that uh, we build something that it will uh, basically, it's, it, it will deteriorate with the, te uh, with the time, but uh, it will still keep uh, its uh, personality. So actually, the Japanese tea house uh, it's at its best after a few years. When it's new, it's not as good as uh, it will become. Because all the materials are natural materials that uh, naturally they will degrade it, and uh, they will be replaced in times. So there are some tea houses in Japan that are like five, uh, 500 years old. But uh, probably there isn't uh, a bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe some wood, but. Uh, uh, of original uh, materials, because they, they keep changing, they keep uh, replacing. And uh, they also keep doing uh, modular, so each uh, dimension and stuff is kind of modular, so they are able to, if they want, to pick, uh, pick up the tea house and move it to another position. And this is something that I think we should try to emulate in our software architecture, not uh, trying to have something perfect when it's new, but something that is, will keep its value as uh, things will change. Because uh, especially in software, it's much worse than architecture. Everything will change very quickly. And this is uh, the main point, modularity. Because uh, also if we do a rewrite, and then I, I will go back, the rewrite uh, must be something better than the original, because otherwise we are going back exactly in the same situation. And the trick to do this is modularity. Having an architecture that can be completely modular 
and uh, can be you can replace one piece at a time. So you don't have uh, this big problem again about legacy. And uh, when I mean modules, it can be internal modules. I mean, it can be a monoblock application which inside uh, several modules, or it can be something like a microservice. But you can also have a microservice architecture that is really not modular because each service is depending on all the other service and you cannot replace one service at a time. Okay, that's not modular, even if you have a microservice. So it's not that the technology is uh, the idea. Something that you can change each module independently and you can work on each module independently. And this, yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, it's a simple architecture, but it's not easy. <laughs> but the modularity gives you flexibility. This is uh, how, yeah, Japanese house, uh, Japanese palace in this case, are built. And uh, everything is a module, and you can change and expand. And uh, okay, this is uh, just uh, when uh, we talk about the. Uh, uh, Legacy rewrite versus rejuvenation, and then uh, uh, rejuvenation is because uh, it's not really a refactoring. This is a bit uh, technical, but uh, yeah, refactoring is something that uh, you want to change your code and uh, keep uh, the same exact uh, functionality. Rejuvenation is something that you wanted to improve your code, so you may have uh, to change a bit of the functionality. So basically, uh, in my experience, I prepare this uh, small thing that I call uh, alchemical rejuvenation. And uh, if you are interested, there are also some talks of mine in uh, YouTube with a more technical detail, but I'll just basically explain here the basically, I mean, the, the general approach. So keep in mind uh, rejuvenation and modularity, and this is how we... Uh, manage our legacy. But first, when we have a legacy system, usually the onboarding is very, very difficult. And uh, the first thing that we have to think about when uh, we are touching a legacy system is that let's simplify the onboarding. Even if it doesn't seem so urgent, it's really, really important. And uh, so basically what I mean is that how much it takes for a new guy to be able to commit something on this uh, legacy system. In some system, it really takes days to set up an environment, but it should be something of hours. And the second point is, uh, okay, let's have a complete end-to-end -end test of the current uh, functionality of the application. And these are not unit tests. They are not even acceptance tests or BDD. Because here we don't want it to exactly to have a same kind of a nice test. We just want to have some test that can let us know how the application. So some input with some output. Even if the tests are very ugly, and maybe in the future we'll throw it away this test when we we'll replace with a better test. But we need something quickly to be sure how the application is working. And note that at this point. If you start this process, you already spent some uh, time because uh, it always takes time to do the onboarding, to do the testing. And uh, you are feeling that we are not achieved nothing. But it's not true because uh, it's, we are actually giving a lot of value to the business. Because uh, if, uh, okay, uh, quick, very quick story because <laughs> we are running out of time. Uh, there was a friend of mine who did uh, this project, uh, and they asked him, uh, please, uh, we need this feature. And uh, they work uh, very, very quickly, and they release the feature. And then they say, OK, we release the feature, but then we need another week to, uh, to write the, um, the test to, to, to uh, refactor the code. And uh, the manager say, what? You didn't that? I mean, <laughs> well, and it's a, my friend was very upset about that, but I think it was completely right because you you are a builder and you ask the builder, okay, can I have my extension, please? And the builder wrote, uh, I mean, build your extension. You pay the builder, and then the builder came and said, oh yeah, but uh, you know, I need another day of work. I mean, another week of work. 
And you say, why? It's finished. Yeah, but I didn't put uh, the anti-fire uh, system. And you say, what? <laughs> I, I mean, it's clear. I mean, wh when you ask us something, you ask us something finished. And uh, if you say, I'm such an urgent that I don't want uh, the fire system, it's something that must be really, really clear from the beginning. Because it's a really big risk. And having the test is really important for the business. It's something that... Uh, as a developer, we should really, really make it clear to the business. So once you have uh, this uh, test, you can split the modules. And then you can refactor the code, because now the code is small. And when everything is clear in that module, you can start with another module, but only if you need. Maybe just one module screen is enough, because you don't have other things to change. So the idea is that. From the original code, you put the test, and then you, you separate the modules, and then you start the, improving the modules once by one. And I have this discussion over and over again, and people say, this is basically, this is not possible. But it's really possible. You just have to try. You just have to take the blue pill. And if you want to see something technical, there are some exercises of mine on uh, GitHub. But the main point of this talk is that uh, rejuvenating your legacy system can be really, really more effective and can also be more fun than writing a completely green system, where greenfield project, I mean, when you really don't know if it will be ever uh, able to, to actually work. And don't throw away your code, <laughs> because there is still value in that. OK, so if you are interested, if you like this talk, please follow me on Twitter or, um, and uh, maybe contact me again.